Hi, you're listening to Dispatches on Parenting Across Cultures with Holly McKay. I'm Holly McKay, and my aim is to take you to many different corners of the globe, illuminating the very different and the very universal ways that we mum and dad. My disclaimer here is that you might hear a few baby cries and giggles in the background. Ah, the joys of being a working mum. And because we are going to many edges of the earth, the quality might not always be so great, so please do bear with me. Now, let's get to the pod. Hi, welcome to the pilot episode of Dispatches Parenting Across Cultures. Uh, This is a new endeavor for me, a little bit in parallel uh, with my work. I have been a war reporter for a really long time and visited many different countries. And I think something that really fascinated me going to these places was in particular parenting and raising children and how that um how it just differs and and there's just so many nuggets of wisdom that I gleaned over the years and then of course becoming a mother myself having a baby last year um I think heightened that fascination a little bit and I wanted to to share so there's many parenting podcasts out there and this isn't that what this is is a bit of an exploration, I think, into different cultures, different parts of the world, um, where I wanted to interview different people and kind of bring to light these different parenting styles. And hopefully there's a lot that you can gain from that, both from mothers and fathers. And for the first episode, to talk a little bit about the podcast and and then, of course, his own experiences. I've got my friend Dennis Santiago here. So thanks for, for coming on, Dennis. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, share the the story of uh, what I went through and 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 the and and the roots of who I am today. So we just wanted to talk a little bit about the podcast first of all, and as I said, this is is going to different different countries and and different parts of the world, and I think. I know I've gained so much insight in in my experiences as a war reporter, but what's interested me, I think, or what's always interested me in my career more than you know, the conflict itself is really the human element of how people survive, how they get through the hard times. And a big part of that is, is you know, people continuing to have families in war-torn places, um, people, you know, continuing to, to try to survive. And I think, um, mothers and fathers are are really key to that and I think sometimes we can get caught up in our own experiences and so I think what I wanted to to kind of share um, a little bit more of a anthropological study than anything else is is just how people do it um how it happens yeah well I mean you know um it's so it's interesting because you're, you're starting this from a uh the how people evolve out of war-torn parts of the world and my story my, my story about you know parenting and and my, the influence of my world and, and and my life actually does start from a war-torn uh beginning in that um so it's born in 1958 which uh, uh, uh to parents who were children during world war ii and uh lived as children lived through the um, the invasion and occupation of the Philippine Islands by the yeah. Japanese Imperial Army, and um, uh, which, in your work, as I'm sure you know, it leaves echoes that do not go away for a very long time, and so I. Am very much a child of of those echoes, um, and I and I carry them around with me. I carry them around with me in my uh, just the inclinations that I have, my personal hobbies. Um, you know, I I take a very big interest in shooting, um, and which is really an echo of uh, having grown up in a place that was still very much influenced by the hardships of having been invaded and occupied and brutalized um, by um, uh, 
a, a very bad war. And uh, so those inclinations of being able to be uh, to to be able to um, take care of yourself and and resist and be self sufficient and and um, and you know like be able to go camping because you might have to take your family and leave your home and do those kinds of things are are very are very ever present and um, it, a it's, lot of that um... influence. Comes yeah did you so i guess what was your earliest memory would you say of your childhood and and where, whereabouts in the philippines were you born i was born in in the capital city of manila um uh, many years after the war right so like anything that i get as far as echoes of that time are influenced by the people that raised me the the community that i grew up in um, how many siblings do you have i wound up with um five siblings and um, were you the eldest yeah and uh and and culturally that also that also leads to not a, a great deal of responsibility that gets put on you my father tended to work overseas um so what my did mother your father do he for many years, uh, did um, installation work of bottling plants around the planet, you know, and basically traveled um, doing this kind of um, engineering assembly work in all kinds of, of, of places. And so he wasn't around a lot. And uh, as the eldest child, my mother came to rely on me as um the person that would uh, do that. I was also the first child of of my generation, so I also got pushed on with the um, a uh, you're the el eldest grandchild. You're setting the example for everybody else in your family thing. So, I I picked up a lot of responsibility, uh, you know, as a substitute parent at a very early age, and which. Um, influences other aspects of my behavior today um i can be uh very pragmatic uh very goal oriented very cold at times in terms of of the way that i handle things less than perfect in uh, my ability to empathize in the moment with other people basically because i had so much responsibility put on me and, so at what um, age and and what early. was sort of some of the what what, what age what, what was some of the responsibilities that um that were put on you as the eldest uh, child looking out for my siblings you know because my mother didn't have uh uh when i was growing up you know she, i mean she had all these kids right and um uh, and then when we moved to the, the united states it was just her alone with this house full of kids and and um and essentially an absent father because he was uh you know trying to earn a living uh everywhere else and he wasn't around a lot and so all of those responsibilities kind of became mine and i be i, I became the parent to my own siblings and, so and at learned... what age what age did you come to the u.s 12 well so, so just prior to that so you're in the philippines can you just give us a little bit of sense about, you know, the house that you grew up in, you know, the food that you ate and what, what your childhood was essentially like there, um, sort of in addition to the responsibilities that you had? Yeah, well, I, 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 you know, I had what I would call a very privileged childhood uh, in, in relative terms. Um, and, um, and, and, and my definition of privilege is not, uh, you know, like being ultra rich or anything like that. Um, my definition of privilege, uh, and I, I showed it off to people once in a uh, a comparison of uh, uh, one Google picture of uh, from a satellite photo. Uh, so I typed in the, the the house that I grew up in in the Philippines and um, was pointing out to people what privilege looks like in this in this world. And so we lived in a, a relatively nice house it had uh it was on two lots it had like 50 fruit trees in it you never and and everybody in the neighborhood would come in there and it was like a whole bunch of little kids crawling around our backyard like a bunch of monkeys um 
snacking on fruit and playing uh, hide and seek all day long, which um, um, so it was, it, was, it was a very nice childhood from, from that standpoint. But on the on one corner of the house was another lot. Uh, half the size of ours, where 150 people, 150 families lived in poverty, and I and I I I, I like to contrast that in terms of uh, by saying you know like but but for the luck of birth I I I could have been in that other lot full of people and um that that's never it is it is I think it is luck it really is um it is luck that yeah you know, where we end up and yeah it's luck yeah 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 and you know and then like and then um yeah i mean uh actually yeah you and i uh, uh went into uh some of this kind of stuff and you introduced me to an organization that actually helps families in the condition of the people that were in that that corner and i still support two of those children today through um a charitable foundation to help them grow up i think i picked them up when they were like i don't know uh, like eight six to eight years old and you know one of them's all about ready to graduate from high school the other one's about ready to start high school and i've been sending them money uh the entire Every time month, and basically yeah yeah and basically it's because you know i remember there wasn't really much difference between me and those and, and the kids that were growing up in that other lot other than you know i had a bedroom and um uh, uh we had private space we had you know we had a dining room that had a real floor and a kitchen that had like real appliances and a living room that had a real stereo and 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 they had nothing right but um but the, through all of that the one thing that was really shared among everybody was this echo of world war ii that was there everywhere and and you could just feel it in everything the games that we played were games of of children playing at war because that was basically what our parents worried about. I I remember when I was about nine nine or ten, uh, a building at the airport caught fire, um, which we we didn't live too far away from, and you know it's just one building. Uh, it, it 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 caught fire because of some industrial accident or whatever was there and I remember my mother you know my father was overseas and my mother going into a panic she started uh grabbing things throughout the house she was grabbing guns she was grabbing supplies she was packing the car uh, uh she was mustering her children telling us to get clothes and all that kind of stuff um uh, so she could run for the hills, you know, because she she um, she was uh, 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 the daughter of an American, so she was uh, uh, white and and light skinned. And in World War II, if you were white or light skinned, um, you got sent to concentration camps by the Japanese. And so and then she, so she lived out in the in the hills throughout World War II with a bunch of guerrillas that uh, you know sheltered her from from all of that and. Um, and the neighbors had to come over and calm her down and basically say, no, no, you know, it's not um, a, um, it, it's just, it's just fire at the airport. It's no big deal. You know, the, 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 there's nothing coming. There's no invasion. There are not going to be, um, you know, uh, bombers uh, destroying the countryside. And I talked to her years later about it. And I, and I asked her, I, I, I said, mom, what was, what was behind that? um panic because I'd never seen you like that before I and I looked in her eyes uh that day and I, and they they burned an image into me of this it's like looking back in time in into someone's soul uh at, at that moment and um and and she explained to me that the, the, what was behind that was the way she found out that World War II happened was uh, uh, December 7th or December 8th, um, depending on the international dateline that you look at, um, she opened a door, front door to their house, um, uh, which was uh, in a town called Cavite, Philippines. And there was a U.S. naval installation there at the time, a big one, 
um, one of the one of the larger ones in in the area. And when she opened the door to the house, all she could see were Japanese airplanes bombing everything and everything blowing up before her eyes. And she could see the flames and the fires and and um, and in that moment that she saw the airport burning because um, to be day she saw it all over again. And it just pulled her right back to 1941 uh, in an instant. And um, and it took the entire neighborhood to calm her down. Um, and, um, you know, I, so I, 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 I don't ever forget things like that. And I don't ever forget, um, there's like weird things that you see from your, from your elders. I mean, I had an aunt and I, I was, uh, we were visiting them in San Diego and I, and they let me have one of the spare bedrooms, uh, to sleep in because, you know, and, and, um, I opened the closet door and, and inside this closet was like mountains of toilet paper. Stockpiling. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. And I, and I, and so I asked my mother, I go like, Hey mom, uh, what's with Auntie Marion and like mountains of toilet paper? And my mother just smiled and she says, oh, that's from the war. I go like, what do you mean? And he says, oh, yeah, after the war, because we lived out in the sticks with gorillas and we had to like wipe ourselves with leaves and stuff like that. She says, your aunt swore that she would have never run out of toilet paper again. And so she's calculated in her head that occupation lasts about four years. So she keeps four years worth of toilet paper around in the house. And I go like, wow. I go like, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, echoes of the, I mean, these are like tiny vignettes, right? But they, mm -hmm. they give you a picture of uh, what that is. And they helped explain to me why I do some of the things I do today from the point of view of like, why do I stockpile food? Why do I, um, you yeah. know, and generational sure generational trauma is a very real thing, especially, um, it, you know, it was. And I think that's one thing that we don't always understand is when these wars happen, they don't just, it, it, you know, it doesn't end when the war ends. You know, this this la this carries through sometimes for multiple generations. Um, and I think really it's only now that we're coming into that self awareness of why yeah, we do what yeah. we do and we can potentially break some of the cycles. But when I see these wars continuing to happen and, and these protracted wars, like what we're seeing in the Middle East or in Sudan or uh, Ukraine, these are going to last a very, very long time. And it's oh, not yeah, yeah, just yeah. the current generation, it's the generations ahead that are also affected yeah. by this. Yeah, and I, I can totally relate to that. I mean, you know, like it's, it's going to be two generations before it gets to where it turned out to be with with my own family when I had children, my children don't have any of those echoes. They 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 don't uh, the the the, the, the chains. Yeah, yeah, able to, able to break, to break the chain, you know, because uh, um, uh, my wife uh, um, wasn't exposed to that kind of stuff in a in another country. She grew up in Culver City, California. Um, uh, rel relative safety and isolation from those kinds of things, a very different life experience. And, and, um, and I made a very deliberate decision not to transmit those generational pains and worries to the next generation. I think I, I, I thought that they needed to um, uh, have a basis for living that wasn't built out of fear that you know they had to keep um a rifle and a, a double basic load of ammunition available at all times and and close by and ready to go because people were going to be coming over to the trenches out of nowhere at them i know there's a lot of other people that that, 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 that live that way but after seeing and looking into the souls of of so many people when I was growing up and seeing that that like primal fear of it that is based on yeah. was based on their life experiences um you know I go like that's I, I didn't want to transmit that one more generation so I've, I've, I've very carefully um uh said no you know that has to stop at a certain point 
and um, there are other things to live for than 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 that. But I I could totally see that like in places that are war torn now, it'll take at least two generations to uh, to break that cycle, and um, that seems to be about the normal anthropological curve to make that happen. But peace has to be there for at least two generations in order for that to happen. So growing up in the Philippines, um, did you go, what was school like there? Did you have a local school you went to? What was that like? Did you go to day oh, I, preschool? Did you have, a, you know, a nanny who kind of, you know, rate, was it just your mother raising you? How did that, how did that work? Oh, no, no. I, I, I was raised by an, a, a, an entire extended family. It, it was, uh, and, and it, it was, it was, I would say it was an idealistic childhood. I mean, you know, and you know, I've talked about uh, uh, childhood. So it's like my world growing up and my very early experience growing up was about as idyllic as you possibly can think of. It's, um, so you grow up on a tropical island, right? You spend your, most of the year with your parents. Every summer, you go and spend it with your grandparents who live in a town by the ocean. So you spend most of your summer um, hanging out at the beach, having coconuts and feasts galore the entire time uh, in, a, in a, a, a very extended household uh, with one of those big, huge Chinese dining tables with the big circulating thing because there's like food all over the place, and um, uh, and where you're you're doing things as as a, a kid. I had a very religious great grandmother. I, you know, I, I got to spend time with with my great grandmother, which is a perfect. Pair. Yeah, oh yeah, and she was. Um, so the the I, I remember when we were young, my my cousin and I. Because we were all there, the, all, all the cousins that were alive at the time, uh, at the very early years when she was around. And there weren't too many of us because the, the clan was still fairly small. Only a few people had started having children. And we would, we were assigned to take turns taking my great-grandmother to midnight mass, which was about, I don't know, maybe a quarter mile walk away from the house that my grandparents lived in. And we would do everything we could not to get picked. <laughs> to go out with a great grandma at midnight yeah. to, to to go i mean because you know you're a young kid and 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 you go like well, can we like i'd rather like go to sleep right but you know no no one of you has to take your grandmother to, uh, down to church for for midnight mass and it's very important to her in the whole thing and um and i remember because she, she she wanted to look out for us so every and you're going out at night right so my she would if you were the one that was going to go with her she would slather you with this awful smelling salve of tiger bomb, which, you know, all it's, it's kind of like, yeah. Uh, yeah, to protect you from getting colds and sicknesses and, and whatever. And I hated the smell of it, but you know, I look back on it now and I go, I grew up in a very extended, very loving family in a town where they were very very accepted and um and and part of the structure of the culture of the town and uh, and everybody knew each other um so it, it's, it, it was it was a great childhood and even when we were living uh, for the rest of the year we're, we're with uh, uh ourselves we had a very extended family um in the neighborhood everybody in the neighborhood was was addressed as was uncle or auntie, mm. right? It's a very Pacific Island type extended family chain um, uh, uh, type of environment where all your elders were um, were part of uh, raising you. And um, I find out many years uh, from another neighbor's uh, thing that the so they the, in the neighborhood where we lived in, they would have these all night mahjong parties. Right. And uh, where they would they would play and, and all that kind of stuff. And all the kids were were like, you know, roaming around the streets until God knows what hour playing uh, until we were all told that it's time to go to sleep. And then the and then the, the parents would do that. That that's where all the parents coordinated on telling each other what their children were doing. 
and uh, so that they could all watch all of the children in the in the neighborhood uh, together. So it was, and I I always thought that was like one of the most wonderfully interesting things yeah. about the neighborhood and and the environment I grew up in. So it's, it was very supportive, very loving, and um, you know, and 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 they because of my mother having to be uh, essentially a single parent because my my father was overseas um they the entire neighborhood encouraged me to take as much responsibility uh, as uh, as i could to look out for the rest of 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 my family which made me it it conditioned me to be super responsible for everything i probably take excessive amounts of responsibility in all of my interactions because of 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 that <laughs> actually in later do you think that in is life. something that you would do you feel in any way that that having so much responsibility kind of robbed you a little bit of a childhood or do you think that the pros of that outweigh the cons I uh, it definitely robbed me of my childhood I grew up way too fast um uh which is not an uncommon thing for some children and uh and in my case I I grew up with an extreme amount of responsibility. I uh, I struck off on my own at a very early age. Uh, I think about 15 when I um, really uh, departed from my family to uh, to go explore the world by my on, on my own, which is very unusual in that um, um, the Philippine culture. You 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 stay a lot closer to your family yeah. for longer. Uh, but I went the opposite direction and and I think as I look back on it what I was trying to do is get away from all of that ex expectation of responsibility so I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore because I wanted to be able to uh, start to explore how to live uh, my own life and I think it's I would say it probably took me about 45 50 years to figure it out and and only in um in the era after COVID, when uh, I, I I decided to talk to a therapist about it, that was I able to like unpack that box and realize just how much that responsibility affected me and everything I had been to everybody else I ever met uh, so, in the remainder of yeah. time because of it. When you came to the U.S., you were twelve. Um, did your extended family come as well? Did you sort of still have that village when you came here or did you find that you were a lot more sort of isolated here than you, you were, were there? extremely isolated. Uh, my, uh, it, it became down, it came down to like one or two relatives. Um, my mother insisted that we settle within easy driving distance of one of her sister's. That was the driving factor. And you came to Southern uh, California, right? When you when yeah, you first yeah, came? Yeah, I came to Southern California and 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 we moved into a town called Fountain Valley, which is, you know, like the in the middle of Orange County. And the main reason we moved to that town was because my aunt also had a house in Fountain Valley at the time. And then later my aunt moved to another town in a little bit further north in, in Orange County to a town called Cyprus. And my mother insisted we had to move, go move to a house also in Cyprus so that we were within easy range of, because that's all the, all the support that she had. She had no other support. Other, other than that, we were completely isolated um, in, in the U.S. I had to, I had to learn, so I was 12 and I had to learn to make new friends. I had, I started high school. 10 days after arriving in America, knowing absolutely nobody in, in, in the school in in a part of, of the United States that at the time was primarily populated by um, uh, uh, you know white middle uh, white lower middle class families. Um, Where did you go to start high school? Was that in El Segundo or? No, no, it was it was it was in um in in uh, okay. uh Garden Grove. 
which was a town one, one town north of of uh, 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 Fountain Valley, and all, and but it, the, the school district covered that area. It's called the Garden Grove Unified. Was school. this was the early nineteen seventies? Yeah, nineteen seventy two. And um, and how how were you treated as an as sort of an immigrant? Did you did you speak English? Like what was that? Oh, I spoke I spoke perfect English. I, I I speak English like I do now. I mean, you know, if you can't tell, I have a very bad Filipino accent, right? Uh, it's I I I I, I yeah. had some at some point in my life, I was working with a bunch of of, of British uh, Royal Air Force pilots, and they and they would joke with me and go like, Dennis, you have a wonderful Ohio accent. And I go, I didn't know Ohio had an accent. They go, Yes, you did, they do, and you sound just like people from Ohio. The school so, here was that like a complete contrast to what you were used to how you treated by oh yeah 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 because uh, uh oh because i so because the schools i went to in the philippines i i only really went to one school in the philippines it was a um from kindergarten through um oh hold on uh from kindergarten through uh everything that i um had uh, had 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 gotten to uh, before the uh, I went to this Catholic uh, private school, so my parents had enough money to send all of their children to uh, to to private school, and so we all all went there. And so every I, I remember in kindergarten, um, you know that that was that was at the at the school, uh, everything all the way up to middle school was there. And I mean I got I got when i was young um so you had to take the bus from your house uh and um and then eventually um i actually figured out how to get around uh, manila by myself i think i was like like eight or nine years old uh taking tricycles and jeepneys and buses wow. And I mean, I mean, can you imagine that today? And, and you know, so you're nine years old. You're you're going out there into basically the wild west. Yeah, no cell phones, <laughs> no exactly. means of contact. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and there's no cell phones. There's no nothing. It, it's it, you kind of go. You tell your mom, I you know, I I want to take my allowance and I want to go get an eclair from the bake shop, which is like wait, and she and they and she just go okay. Right. And so you'd walk right. out, you'd get the, so you would walk out, you would catch one of those little motorcycle based, uh, little, 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 they, I, call, I think they call them pedicabs because they, you start off being a um, little tuk tuks. Yeah. 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 Essentially they're, they're, they're little tuk tuks and uh, is what they call them in other parts of Asia. And you take that out to the main highway where, um, uh, you can catch a Jeep, a jeepney, which is, you know, one of those, the, those things where you everybody it's no seat belts or anything like that you just kind of like get on board and go and then and then you 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 take it all the way into the next bigger main highway and then you take a bus and then and then you walk and this is all to have like one chocolate eclair and then you come all the way back home and you do it by yourself at nine years old and That's a lot, nobody yeah. Nobody cares, you know, it's like, because there's like kids that are even younger than you, they're living all on their own in the more impoverished parts of town that are orphaned or, or, or deeply poor. And, you know, and like, at least you got money in your pocket to afford the fare. Right. You know, so like, um, and, and I, re I remember that vividly from the point of view of like, Talk of it. Try that in the United States today. You'd, you'd arrest the parents for letting their children. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, but you know, but when I was growing up, it was like, yeah, you want to do that? Yeah, sure. You know, we'll see you when you get home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then and, uh, come, coming to the U.S., did you find that that you still had those freedoms, or that it was a little bit more restrictive? Um, no, in, no, in no. Terms when of I was when I was. No, when I was growing up, the first thing my parents did, well, the first thing my, my, yeah, my parents did was they bought, so my, my younger siblings, their school was like right across the main road from, 
uh, where our house was because they, they they try to keep the elementary schools close by. But my high school was a, a bicycle ride distance away. So my parents just bought me a bike, right? So here I am, it's 1972. I get this brand new, um, and I thought it was like the greatest thing in the whole world, a uh, 20 inch bicycle uh, spider bike with a banana seat and the whole thing and the big, uh, you know, and, I, and and that's what I would ride to uh, to go to school with. And then you would lock your bike up uh, there uh, along with all the other kids that were doing exactly the same thing. And, um, and then later on, they got me a 10 speed, which gave which it vastly increased your range because you it was a lot easier to ride to go places. And I would go all over town with this with this thing. Um, uh, uh, it to to any place I felt like going down to the beach, whatever. Yeah, you know, just just go and do it. Um, what really struck me about it, so I go, I, I wound up at this high school, knowing nobody, and um, probably in a tribute to um, uh, where you get really really lucky, and 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 it is, it's it's a, it's. It's, it's, it's a stroke of great luck. I was completely accepted at this high school by all of the other kids and all of the teachers. Um, well, most of the teachers. I think there was one from the district that wasn't quite too sure about me. But, um, uh, but, but they just took me in with open arms. And um, uh, which doesn't happen to everybody but in 1972 it happened to me and uh, and all of those people that remain my friends to this day i mean you know probably if i were if i were to look at my facebook friends list i would say 35 percent of it are people that i knew in high school and extended yeah it's it's like they're 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 like my really it's like it's like my version of an extended family uh it is is there and we uh you know we, and we've shared stories about things over the years of, of uh what what was becoming of us in our lives how the um what we were doing with our children and then later on as time went on um uh who was passing away um and you know the group gets smaller and tighter um and uh and we'd organize reunions and all that kind of stuff with, with everybody just to see each other and smile. So it, uh, I, I think I got very, very lucky in that score, just like I think I got very, very lucky when I was uh, at a very young age and had this experience of a, a broad thing. And I, I, I actually have figured I crave that kind of um, broad base of people that you know and the and, and people that accept you that's my comfort zone in terms of stuff i like having like lots and lots of people even my shooting thing i probably have shooting friends from all over the all over the world actually um and um and and what i if you go to like a national competition you're catching up with probably 150 to 200 people in the space of about a week and a half that you hardly ever see but relate to very closely because you've kept close touch and so that's my comfort zone in the world and a lot of that comes from what i learned when i was young in terms of what makes me happy and what kind of environment i like i like to be in and and stuff so i i would say you know like quite honestly a very lucky life is is what i would put myself into the category of, and I've tried to teach my children that, that you know, it's kind of that, 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 that that's a good thing to, uh, to have with you. And so just on that note, so you've got two girls, adult girls, I believe mid thirties, late twenties. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. They've grown up now. They're not, they're not, they're not girls anymore. They're, they're, they're actually your age. Uh, and, yeah. um, which is, uh, uh, you know, and 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 I, I I do have to thank you here uh, in an ode to to my own vanity that uh, you you've uh, as as you've had your your own child you have you have acquiesced to my 
to my request to please teach your child to call me Uncle Dennis instead of Grandpa, uh, even though I'm probably kind of the same age as your parents. It's so good. Definitely Uncle Dennis to Raven. <laughs> um, but just consciously, like, knowing your experience, childhood, what, when you became a father, what did you, how did you raise your children in, in making sure that the things that you felt when, you know, maybe not so positive about your own childhood, you were able to impart, or what sort of was your conscious approach to, to being a dad? Um, so here's where it gets interesting from the point of view of my story of parenthood. Uh, I wanted to break the mold from being ultra responsible for everything, which is also being, you know, ultra controlling of, of everything. And that um, there, I just had this instinctive thought that, you know, that that wasn't the right way to go, but I had no idea how to be a father. I literally, what I had was an idea of how to be the eldest child taking care of your family. Which is not the same thing as finding a model in how to be a father from a father. So I had this vacuum of knowledge uh, when I had children. And it has, I think it has cost me a lot because I had to learn how to do everything from scratch and I made mistakes all along the way because the the what I learned how to do as a child uh and had translated into my ability to do things in business paid no no applicability to what happened when I crossed through the door into the house into uh the world of raising a nuclear family in the United States with an Americanized um, 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 system of roots with only like two children and a mother and a father and the whole thing. And, and I, I really didn't know what to do. And so I, I had to like learn from, I mean, you know, it's like, my models on how to do that were like, well, how would my grandfather uh, handle things? Uh, but you know, that was a bit too demanding on on uh, because my 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 grandfather's thing was uh, that everybody had to go get a college degree and everybody had to like be diligent. The, the very Asian kind of um, this is what you have to do to succeed so that you don't wind up living in poverty, type type stuff, right? Um, and, it's a safe um, a safe formula, um, much safer yeah. formula than than probably the the sort of Gen Gen Z yeah, or even but, the millennials of today that are much more willing to I guess break that traditional. Yeah, but but that but you know but but from my mother, so my father wasn't around much because he was out making money you know which which is something i learned how to do and something i learned how to do very very well and and also took me away from my family far more than i probably should have been um but my mother was she said i got i got six kids and each of these kids are different and i'm and i want each of you to figure out how to express yourselves as individuals so that you're not you're not beholden to a mold which is very different yeah. from uh the the my extended family which had very strong expectations about you know the mold that you should be in so i had these mixed metaphors that i was trying to work with and my mother's influence was far more important to me in terms of like the value of letting your children become who they need to be so that they can find happiness as individuals in their lives and express them um what i realized though was that I had no idea what I wanted to be in, in order to express my happiness in my life because the only thing I'd ever been trained to do was be the responsible oldest brother or the responsible oldest grandson. And that's, I had to unlearn a lot of that stuff and then, and learn, you know, what, what does it take to be, you know, a loving, caring father? You know, 
methods. Um, um, and it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. It was you, it was a painful yeah. learning experience to 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 figure that out. And I'm not really sure I figured out everything. Did you incorporate any of your elements of your own childhood, even though you're now in a different country, you know, with your own kids? Or is there parts of your childhood that you wish that your kids had had that they didn't growing up in Southern California? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I so I I tried to incorporate um elements of self-sufficiency and responsibility and um you know the the ability to um figure things out problem solve and all that kind of stuff and and for and you know and it, it uh, and it took right but i also had to learn other things about being a parent in um in the united states of um stuff they don't teach you and stuff that, that that doesn't that didn't happen i wasn't able to observe it uh, as a child and that uh and particularly so probably one of my harshest lessons is um when my children were very young when they were babies and 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 you know tiny young they said so they're just like these loving children that i i just got addicted to cuddles and hugs and quiet conversations and time I'm mean, times I mean you know like I, I babysat your your kid right and it was like like heaven to me to have a to have like this trusting child um in your arms and all that kind of stuff because that's that was that was my first part of it and um but there were things I just didn't know about parenting in the real world. Um, and probably the biggest thing I didn't know was because uh, I have two daughters. Right. And and uh, I didn't understand that at a certain point. It was a shock to me. It wasn't a shock to my wife because she had gone through it. But at a certain point, your children become adolescents. And in America, that's the stage where they stop being little girls and start to become women and they need to learn how to stop being trusting little girls in their father to being women who can comport themselves in a world of being a woman interacting with men and with all of the skills to go along with that and so it turns out that the way that works is you're the father, so they practice on you, which turns into a period of at a certain point, one day your child is says, your dad, you're like the greatest person in the whole wide world, and I adore you and love you, and you're the big, and then the next morning you wake up and you go like, you are the biggest ogre on this planet, you know, you're onerous and I'm and, looking and, forward and, to those and, days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know. Well, Ryan has to look forward to those days because it. So, like, and so the biggest lesson I got out of that was one, that happened, and it was a total shock to my system. And 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 Leslie said, "No, you know, like, hey, that's your job right now. Your job is is to be that that's that that stand post that they can test all of their mm -hmm. ideas about." How to how to become women and how to protect themselves in the world and comport themselves in the world and and you know so they're gonna pound on you left and right and you have to play the role of that intransigent post that um, that gives them a chance to learn this stuff so that they don't get taken advantage of uh in 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 the outside world and and she said you know i had you know she said i put my poor unless because i put my fathers through that you know and then and now your daughters are going to put you through that and um i didn't know that was going to happen right you know because i i'd never seen it before and uh, so i did and you know and my kids would and 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 i i would be reassured you know no no after about a dozen uh, uh, between 10 and 15 years They'll come back and they'll you know they'll realize uh, the, everything that you've done for them, but I used to do that and um, be that that 
that wall that would that they could bang against as they were learning and and they would yell and scream and look at you with like and and then i would then they would leave angry and i would um my wife would come and she would say you did a good job you know and go oh, and i go thanks the whole thing and then i would i would go hide in the garage i go into my car in the garage with the lights off in, inside the thing and I would just cry to myself because these are my little girls and you miss the hugs and you wonder if they're ever going to be there again and they may not be. It's a harsh lesson in what it takes to be a good parent. And I think it's a universal one because I think you you want everybody that I've talked to about their kids, uh, fathers with sons go through the same kind of they have to learn how to how to stop being boys and become men. Um, fathers with daughters, they 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 have to be that wall that their children rail against and. Uh, Oh my God! And I've had so many conversations with other other fathers, and this is America. This is American culture stuff, in, in particular. But just how hard it is to be a good parent under under the and and universally, I'm surprised at how many other dads go like, yeah, I go in the garage, hide and cry too. Yeah, we don't we don't talk about that part of it. I think you know, as moms, we there's a lot of openness about challenges and of, of of motherhood and trying to balance everything and be everything all at once but I think yeah we don't we don't really talk about the the father side of it so I think that's um it's yeah something that yeah it would like to see yeah. we talk more at it, more about because it's certainly there that's where the yeah. feminine masculine kind of uh, I guess stereotypes stop us from yeah, I yeah, having it, these it, full it, conversations. It does. It, it it goes to, you know, what's the importance of having a father who's around? I and like my dad was gone most of the time. So like I never got a role model to learn how to do this. So it was double hard for me because I'm going through it, going like, what the hell am I supposed to do? <laughs> Nobody ever taught me how to do this. You know, I my all my fire. other siblings, my father was around more because by then he had stopped traveling around the world, right? But when they got to that adolescent age, so they got the chance to to do that with with him that I never got the chance. You know, at that point I was gone from the house and the whole thing. And uh, so I'm like, and I'm, I'm going, you know, I'm trying to get through probably one of the most difficult periods of parenting that, that you have to go through. And I don't have a full deck to play with. Because I don't have all the cards in my hand, I don't have all the, the 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 internalized lessons of what to do, and oh my God! So, um, but I did know how to use the extended family thing. So what I did is I started asking people, like, "What the hell do you do?" And they go like, "Oh my God, you know, this is like what's going on." You're like, 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 so how do you solve? How did you solve that? When they go like, "Well, there is no solution for it," you know, you just kind of like gotta wait it out and all that kind of stuff, you know. And and um, they go like, "Your your, your children have uh um, they're they're going through their brain damage phase, which is like everything is broken inside their head, and they have to restructure all of their models for it." So so I've lived through that. Um, um, I do still to this day miss that that just magical stage of having small children they are it is it's bliss yeah. absolute bliss and um it makes me cry still to this day when i realize it may never come back or 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 or, or that it really is gone well hopefully you'll be a grandfather someday <laughs> you girls decide to go down that path well, yeah. Well, you know, why do you, why do you think I keep sending you uh, messages saying, you know, you've got to find a way to get to get out to where I am, and please drop yeah. right off. 
I will. Well, whenever, whenever, I can you hear her crying. Yes, and talking about this certainly just in this conversation makes me miss her. So I um I want to keep talking and and hopefully we could do a part two of this because I think there's so much to unpack. But one thing I I wanted to ask you just in a nutshell. What were, based on your experiences, what words of wisdom would you impart to other fathers um, at this stage of your life? Um, at this stage of my life, the, uh, the, the the words of wisdom that I would tell to, to, to fathers is, uh, one, um, enjoy the young years while they are there. Try to be around as much as possible and soak in as mm -hmm. much of it as you can because it's not going to last. Second, when they get to the stage where you are the um, the immovable wall, be the best immovable wall you can because it is your one shot to teach them everything that they need to know about how to be good adults. And then the third is take the time to both experience the internal emotional joy and the regrets that go along with it. Fourth, you're going to make mistakes. There's nothing you can do about it. It, it just, it just kind of is. And it's not your fault that you don't know everything. You're not perfect. And um, and once you accept that and that the fact that you can learn by, by continuing to um, look for how this role model, you, you, you have to keep studying it in, in terms of what do you need to do to be a better parent? Because uh, that's your job really you know that's that's the the it's the, it's the most important job and I think that I have to remind myself of that a lot as much as I loved my career and I've loved you know all the other parts of my life my life now is the focus is my children and everything else comes a very distant second to that and everything I do is for my children you know including my my career it's to to make enough money for them to have a you know a good enough life to take them traveling which is my objective um to help them understand the world so everything I do it does come from a lens of how is this yeah. going to benefit my child hopefully children yeah. and yeah. yeah that that's the lens that, that I think I see the world from and um and I think, I mean, we can also talk about this for a long time. There's, I think, I think parenting does need a little bit of a, a positive PR campaign. I think so much out there is the challenges of it, the difficulties of it, the cost of it, and that's all very real. But I think at the end of the day, it is, you know, for me, um, there's a lot of things I've done in my life. There's a lot of things I will do in my life, but it really is the greatest thing I have done and will ever do. And I think if people are on the fence about, I'm sure if they want to go down the path or not, I just, I would just say yes, if you can, because it is yeah. the love that you will never understand in any other context. We can love our parents, we can love our friends, we can love our siblings, but the love for a child is just a whole other level. Something oh, yeah. that, is, you know, Raven is my my greatest spiritual teacher in that, and I'm so grateful for uh, I'm gonna privilege, tell you, yeah. really. Yes. Definitely. It is it is a total privilege. I'm gonna tell you what my favorite possession is. Yeah. Um, so uh many years ago, uh, well, not that many years, well actually many years ago now. Um uh uh Leslie and the girls uh gave me a Christmas present, a t-shirt. My favorite t-shirt in the whole world. Okay. You know what it says on it? Dad's rescue service. Oh, that's adorable. <laughs> so every time they need something and and they call up and, and and you know and they and they still do they call up and they go like dad yeah like i you know they're because there's something they they can't figure out and you know and then so you, you so you you help them figure out the whole thing i always put that dad's rescue uh, service uh t-shirt on when they when they go like oh yeah and they go yeah 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 you know you're, you're we love you that's that the whole thing and i love that shirt 
not because of what it says or what it transmits, but because they gave it to me. Special. That's love. It is. Well, I got to get to my baby. I hear her in the background. So this has been um, this has been great. Thank you for being my my pilot episode. I hope that we can do another part um, down the road a little bit. And yeah, please the um, uh, please keep you know sharing your your wisdom with us. And hopefully, I can keep sharing that with the the broader the broader world. This is a beautiful series that you are doing. It is uh, and you. very much needed. I I. I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to talk to me about like my weird journey about and all the stuff that I've learned along the way. It thank is. You. It's fascinating. There's so much to unpack. And I mean, we could talk for hours. So um, there will be a next time. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs>